downtown Detroit. Local 4 News at 5 starts now. Irma is a menace, a Category 5 hurricane, and it's got its sights set on South Florida. We'll show you the track coming up. All right, Ben, also dreamers denied. President Trump keeps a controversial campaign promise, and now thousands of immigrants are left wondering what comes next. But first, we're getting our first look at the man now formally charged with murdering his own aunt and uncle in a fit of rage. Thanks for being with us for the News at 5 tonight. We're learning grim new details into the case that shocked a quiet Warren neighborhood. 37-year-old Joseph Boroviak now faces two murder charges and the death of his aunt and uncle inside their home. Jason Colthorpe covering the story for us. And Jason, we are uh, learning more about the possible cause of death here. We are, Devin. In fact, uh, police now saying it's not, uh, they weren't shot, this couple that lived here, but actually it's blunt force trauma. We also learned that Boroviak had threatened other family members and written it down in a list and police staying away from calling it a hit list, but that seems to be exactly what it may have been. You understand that charge? Joseph Boroviak showed no emotion and gave one word answers as he faced charges of murdering his aunt and uncle. A Warren detective explained what officers found when they caught up to him on Ryan Road in Detroit after the murders. Taken into custody, he had blood spatter on his sweatshirt and a drop of blood on his eyeglasses. The medical examiner stated the cause of death was blunt force trauma. On his Facebook page, police found he'd threatened other family members. We uh, were able to um, identify some of the relatives and they were in our custody at the time for their own protection. We did take those precautions. So we were concerned about possibly uh, other persons uh, um, you know, being uh, murdered. Adding to the shock of this murder is that police say the victims, 67-year-old Steve Collins and his 66-year-old wife Cindy, helped raise Boroviak. Only the person that committed the homicides can really answer why. And, and that's the big question. Why would you murder people that actually raised you, cared about you, supported you, helped you, and then you go to their home and you viciously kill them? Many unanswered questions that we might get answers to on September 14th when Boroviak is in court next. No bond, obviously. There, he has a few former uh, drug convictions plus a robbery conviction. But of course, the heinousness of this crime led to the no bond. We're in Warren tonight. Jason Coulter, Local 4. Yeah. All right, Jason. Developing right now, businesses in Gross Point Woods are now able to return to normal operations after an underground explosion forced evacuations. City officials say the explosion caused southbound Mack Avenue at Bournemouth Road uh, to close. We're told a manhole cover blew, which prompted police to evacuate businesses. And it also urged, they also urged the public to avoid the area. The roads in that area, though, we're told are now back open. Live pictures right now from St. Thomas, the U.S. Virgin Islands. Clouds starting to move in as a Category 5 hurricane is not too far off the horizon. The governor of Puerto Rico has already asked the president to declare a federal emergency ahead of Hurricane Irma. Yeah, Ben's tracking it for us tonight. Ben, Irma already more powerful than Hurricane Harvey. And you look at the pictures, it just looks like a, a buzzsaw just churning yeah, out there. That's exactly right. <laughs> I mean, this thing is a monster. It is a Category 5 storm. And there is nothing in its way to slow it down or stop it. Uh, this is Irma from space. From our satellite vantage point, you can see what looks like that stadium eye that a lot of the hurricane hunters see when they fly into it. Sustained winds of over 180 miles an hour. And if the track stays in just a few days, it's headed to Florida. They are heating the warnings across Florida. Every family's got to get ready. Gassing up. Gassing up our vehicles today. You know, I think we're just doing what everybody else is doing. And stocking up. We're looking for some gas cans and extension cords. Lines formed early at this Costco. Black Friday sized crowds, leaving some store shelves empty. From Miami to Naples and as far north as Temple Terrace near Tampa. Please understand that we are asking you to be prepared and not panic. Yes, sir. From coast to coast, to cross the Sunshine State. All the stuff with Harvey, I mean, that's that's kind of the, the, the extent of the problems that they've had there. And then plus we've had, you know, our, our storms here not that long ago. Um, and uh, we, we got hit pretty good 
before, so people are being a little more vigilant, I guess. Residents are bracing for Hurricane Irma, churning in the Atlantic and still days away. We have to watch it very closely. The Category 5 storm is already the strongest ever recorded outside of the Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico, and the potentially catastrophic hurricane could make landfall in Florida over the weekend. Where the rush is on to be ready. Well, those tracks that you saw in that package were old. These are the new ones just coming in from the National Hurricane Center. The 5 o'clock advisory with 185 mile an hour sustained winds. This is going to roll north of Dominican Republic, north of Cuba, and then eventually make landfall as we head towards Sunday, somewhere south of Florida. And when we look at the state of Florida, the water temperatures all around the state, mid to upper 80s. That's just jet fuel for this monster storm. So there really is not a whole lot that is going to slow down. It may fluctuate between a four or five and it could be making landfall pretty much anywhere in the southern part of the Sunshine State. But what we do know for sure is it's going to be a major hurricane and it is going to cause significant damage. So we'll keep an eye on it. The only good news is it's not going to produce near as much rain as Harvey, but that's um, I guess a faint, uh, a faint, faint news yeah, tonight. And if you filled up your gas tank today back to Harvey, you know the price of gas has gone up again, and you can blame our last hurricane for that. AAA Michigan reports the average price for a gallon of gasoline in Michigan today is up to 262. That's up 16 cents from just one week ago. A year ago on this date, gasoline was 229 per gallon. Oil industry uh, analysts have some encouraging news, though. They say they say gasoline prices should decline by the end of this month or early October. We'll see. All right, more on the hurricane front as we continue over this next 90 minutes of news, but now to a major change in immigration policy. Today, President Trump's administration announced plans to end DACA, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, which protects undocumented immigrants who came to the United States as children. As Blaine Alexander reports, the president now wants Congress to develop a better policy. Well, Devin, this is a decision that's drawing an emotional response from members on Capitol Hill of both parties. Some calling the move cruel and heartless, but others saying that it does not go far enough. From the White House gates to the shadow of Trump Tower, from coast to coast, an angry outcry against President Trump's decision to end DACA, the Obama-era policy allowing undocumented immigrants who came to America as children to remain in the U.S. This does not mean they are bad people or that our nation disrespects or demeans them in any way. It means we are properly enforcing our laws. In a statement, President Trump said, I do not favor punishing children for the actions of their parents, but we are a nation of opportunity because we are a nation of laws. It means a loss of protection for nearly 800,000 undocumented immigrants in the U.S., so-called dreamers like Carlos Arellano, who came to America at age 15. This is my people, this is my country, this is my home. He tells me he is now months away from graduating nursing school. And I grew up here, I went to high school, I graduated, I've been working, I've been paying taxes since the moment I started working. I think it's a cruel, evil, vicious decision today. It's not cold-hearted for the president to uphold the law. We are a nation of law and order. President Trump now forcing Congress to take sides, giving lawmakers six months to come up with a better plan. Kids will be thrown back into the darkness. That doesn't help fix a broken immigration system to, be, uh, to take these kids and ruin their lives. We are young immigrants, young people are the future of this country. So uh, please, you know, don't play with our futures and uh, uh, please help us. A message echoed by thousands counting on their adopted country to keep them here. And today, former President Barack Obama weighed in on this. In a statement, he said that it's about decency and treating these kids the way we would want our own kids to be treated. In Washington, Blaine Alexander, Local 4. And I'm Coco McAvoy. We are live in Clark Park from southwest Detroit. You can see people have gathered here with signs. They're in support of DACA. And coming up at 530, we'll have a full story from the rallies across Metro Detroit. And you'll hear from people who are impacted by this decision. Okay, Coco.
A man who managed to escape Detroit police while in handcuffs is back in custody. 23-year-old artiste Deshaun Davis is charged with resisting and obstructing police and escape from lawful custody. Police stopped Davis for speeding on Detroit's west side last week, and after cuffing him, he ran off. Davis was back in custody Sunday. He's facing an additional charge of larceny for stealing police handcuffs. Police in Redford Township are investigating an overnight armed robbery. Uh, police confirmed that an armed robbery took place early this morning at the 7-Eleven on the northeast corner of Schoolcraft Road at Inkster along the I-96 Jeffrey Service Drive. Little known about the robber, but police do say that fortunately no one was hurt during the robbery. Today marked the first day of classes at public schools across Michigan. Big day, of course, for students and parents and teachers and for the new superintendent of the Detroit Public Schools Community District. Nikolai Vitti marked the morning with visits to some classrooms. I would have visited a couple of schools and so far the energy has been positive. I think principals feel a new sense of support by the district as far as the opening of schools was concerned. We met with them one on one and asked them what they needed to make sure we had a smooth opening. The district has 250 teacher vacancies. Substitute teachers are filling in while 50 new teachers are currently being processed. All right, on this first day of school, just getting started here at 5 o'clock. We've got a lot more ahead in this next hour of news, including a sneak peek inside Little Caesars Arena as the ribbon is cut. And this is one very special back-to-school picture, what this young girl has endured to make it back to class. Priya? Local activists are calling for Detroit Police Chief James Craig to step down from a political appointment many Detroiters probably didn't know he had. at six. Moving out, a local inn shutting its doors for good, leaving families homeless. What's next for the people who live at the Royal Inn? Steve? The iconic rock here at U of M in Ann Arbor is a place for school spirit and messages of unity. But last week it was messages of hate. That's coming up at six o'clock. Now here at five, something a lot of people don't know. Detroit Police Chief James Craig actually wears two very important hats in the city. That he does. In addition to his du deputy duties as chief, Craig is also Detroit's deputy mayor. And one group says that's just too much for one person to handle. Priya Mann is live tonight. Uh, Priya, they're calling for him to step down as deputy mayor. Yeah, that's right. The Coalition Against Police Brutality claims that the chief can't focus both on his department as well as his duties as deputy mayor. And Chief Craig calls these allegations simply absurd. I reject any notion by Kenneth Reed and the coalition that this department's out of control. The Detroit Coalition Against Police Brutality is calling for Police Chief James Craig to step down as deputy mayor. If you want to be into politics and stuff and you might want to look at running for mayor in 2021, well, go into that direction. Leave, uh, leave this job and leave it to someone who will be singularly focused on serving the interests of the citizens of the city of Detroit. The only politics that I have is one of serving the people of this city. The coalition is speaking out after the death of 15-year-old Damon Grimes last month. The team is riding an ATV in Detroit when he was pursued by state police. A trooper used a taser on Grimes shortly before the teen crashed into a pickup truck and later died. That trooper has since been suspended. What I would like to say to the chief is simply this. If, again, you know, get, get a rein on your officers. They need more training, it, it appears, some of them. We're talking about a specific incident involving the Michigan State Police. Uh, I wonder did Mr. Reed call for a, a, a change in leadership at the state police. And the chief also went on to say that it was under his leadership that an independent investigation into the pursuit was launched. The coalition reiterated today they're not anti-police, but they are anti-police brutality. Reporting live from DVD headquarters, I'm Priya Mann, Local 4. All right, Priya, thanks. All good things must come to an end, and that includes riding the Q line for free. All summer, of course, the M1 rail line has been providing free rides up and down Woodward, but as of this morning, streetcar system started charging its riders. Cost to ride the 6.6 mile stretch connecting downtown uh, to the new center area, buck 50 for a three hour time period or $3 for an all day pass. Uh, seniors and passengers with disabilities pay 75 cents to ride.
All right, we just saw in Priya's uh, yeah. live report out there, Whoa. quick uh, little shower out there. Yeah, and it's a downpour in some yeah. cases. Yeah. Uh, there's just enough instability to really bring that rain down. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't seen any thunderstorms yet. Uh, can't rule them out, though, uh, as we get through the next few hours. Four Live Radar has got a couple of those downpours on the east side, right over the city and uh, downriver as well. You get north of Detroit, we've got a few more. Uh, some of these have been showing up red on the radar. In fact, uh, this one in northern Oakland County as well. But again, no lightning strikes. Still the possibility we could see a uh, thunder storm, but we're not looking for severe weather. There's just enough instability to lead to maybe some small hail uh, out of these, uh, but it's going to be uh, very small and should not cause any damage. Otherwise, we still have chances of showers that are going to last through the evening hours tonight. Got raindrops on the lens here as we look over downtown Detroit. 63 is where we're at right now. We've got rain at the airport and the winds are out of the west northwest 21 miles an hour. Pretty breezy out there. Obviously, Nowhere near as breezy as what we're going to be watching with Irma, and we'll be checking in more on that storm on Local 4 News at 530. 72 is uh, what we got to today for a high temperature, which did uh, fall short of average at 78. And even though it was cool this morning and below average, not going to be nearly as chilly as what we start out with tomorrow morning when we're looking at 40s area wide. So we get the rain out of here tonight, wake up with dry conditions tomorrow, and by tomorrow afternoon, we could be seeing more of the same with some scattered showers around in the afternoon hours. That may spread a little bit more than just the east side, uh, but those will fade by Wednesday evening. Thursday, a little disturbance moves through and could trigger some more showers and possibly lingering a little bit later on into Thursday night. But after that, we don't have any rain in the forecast, and that's going to last through the middle and possibly end of the next work week. 50 degrees tonight. Scattered showers coming to an end. We will see partly cloudy conditions overnight. Our four zone forecast looking at high temperatures tomorrow, and those numbers going to be cool. In fact, uh, we will not hit 70 like we did today in some spots. 67 in Detroit. That's going to be one of our warmest temperatures tomorrow. South zone temperatures pretty much the same here. Mid uh, 60s, uh, anywhere between 66 and 67. Slightly cooler here in our west zone. Remember, we're going to have a fair amount of clouds in the afternoon tomorrow. In fact, we're going to call it mostly cloudy 64 to 67 for those highs there. And our coolest numbers are going to be 63, and that's going to be up in Sanilac County tomorrow afternoon. So the seven day forecast gets cooler as we hit it Thursday. That's going to be the chilliest that we'll have to contend with that 64 degree high. But even though we hit 50 for three days straight, at least in the city, we're going to see a lot of 40 degree lows as we get through the next few days. Numbers do come up a bit, just getting back to average as we start Monday of next week week, but look at all that sunshine. Weekend doesn't look half bad, a little bit on the cool side, but it's going to be bright and dry and we at least get the 70s back. So psychologically yeah. that we need to yes, we need to move into this slowly. Yeah, smoothly. transition really. Yes, yeah, we'll see if we can get that down. All right, thanks, Ben. Follow. OK, so you think the first day of school is anxiety ridden for the students? Where do you meet some of the parents? <laughs> All right, Paula, but first, the community devastated. What we're learning uh, now about a deadly crash over the weekend that claimed five young lives. That's next. Let's look at stories making headlines from across the state of Michigan tonight. Let's start in Kalamazoo. That's where police say a 15 year old boy was behind the wheel of a car that crashed into a tree late Friday night, killing all five people inside. The victims ranged in age from 15 to 17. Police say the car was traveling at about 100 miles per hour when it left the road, hit a tree and exploded into flames. Grief counselors were available this morning for students at several Kalamazoo schools. Governor Snyder joined thousands in crossing the Mackinac Bridge uh, yesterday, the 60th annual Labor Day walk. Officials say around 25,000 people took part in the annual walk across Mackinac, the five mile long bridge that connects Michigan's upper and lower, pen lower peninsula. All traffic was halted on the bridge for the first time ever as a security precaution. The event has been held every year since the late 1950s. Today is a very special day for a survivor of the shooting rampage in Kalamazoo. Sure is. 15 year old Abby Koff joined thousands of students across Michigan going to their first day of school. And that is saying something for Abby. But here are the first day photos to prove it. She's going to attend uh, Harper Creek High School. She's going to attend part time as she continues to recover. Uh, she hopes to return full time soon, we're told. 
February of 2016, so a year and a half ago, uh, Jason Dalton went on that five hour shooting spree, shooting cough in the head, killing six others. She's going to go to school about two to three hours a day. She's yeah. going to have a personal assistant with mm -hmm. her all at all times. So that's uh, kind of an indication she's still got a long way to go. She, and she's been through but, so much, so many surgeries, yeah, has a yeah. plate in her head, but yeah. wow, what an accomplishment just to, to, get, see, this. to yeah. get here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Back great. with more in just a minute. Coco? New at 5.30. Dozens of people gather in Troy to spread a simple message. Keep DACA. We are American, Mexican American, Latino American, but we are raised here and this is our country. Coming up, you'll hear from some of the people impacted and what this could mean for the DACA students. He was just there taking pictures. A sheriff's deputy makes a split second decision while responding to a crime scene. Well, what a day here in the city of Detroit. After 20 years, they finally have been able to come up with the new Little Caesars Arena. Here it is. It's time for a change and uh, everything. This whole city's changing. Now we've got a new arena. we got the Pistons down here. It's great things. So what's it like inside and what does it mean to this town? We'll let you know. For years, we've seen the renderings and watched the building go up. Now, Little Caesars Arena is ready for its close-up as the ribbon is cut. It is hard to believe that we are now just under a week away from the first official event at Little Caesars Arena, Kid Rock Concert. Olympia Entertainment doing a soft opening this week and it started with a ribbon cutting. Recognize that mm. very familiar face. Uh, Carmen was there as well, getting a sneak peek at what's inside Detroit's newest landmark. Our business editor Rob Maloney takes us on a tour. Well, here we are inside Little Caesars this Arena way. and I can assure you, it has that new arena smell. Now take a look around. It is spectacular. Red seats going all the way up to the ceiling. You've got championship banners and retired numbers for the Red Wings and the Pistons. $800 million spent. 50 blocks is what they're going to end up developing in and around this arena. A spectacular event led off by a big ribbon cutter. Two, one, cut! They struck up the brass band and cut the ribbon declaring LCA's construction all but complete. Chris Illich says his father Mike came up with the idea after finishing Comerica Park in 1999. And while Mike didn't live to see it completed, he knew about every plan and idea executed in the building. It's been an incredible journey, but I think it's been exceptionally exciting and well worth it because the impact that this project has had on the people of this community has been tremendous. Illich pointed out $700 million went to Michigan-based contractors, 61% of those were Detroit-based companies, and a lack of skilled tradespersons locally led to a new apprenticeship program. Still, the city of Detroit fined the LCA contractors about $3 million for not hiring enough Detroiters per city ordinance. That notwithstanding, the place will open with an eye toward keeping the great stuff about the Joe, but vastly improving on it. Former Red Wing Joe Koser sees it. Joe Lewis is pretty special, but now it's time for a change and uh, everything. This whole city's changing. Now we've got a new arena. we got the Pistons down here. It's great things. And former Piston Earl Curitan agreed. Everybody's been asking when are the Detroit's coming back, when are the Pistons going to come back, and now today, you know, they're going to come back to the city of Detroit. And I think it's going to be extremely impactful for the city. Well, say hello to all of my friends here inside Little Caesars Arena. Yes, the Red Wings to play here along with the Pistons. We got a little bit of a look today, but the big nickel tour comes tomorrow. Friday night, there's a charity preview event. Then on Saturday from 2 to 8, you can come in and see it. Go to clickondetroit.com for all the details. In downtown Detroit, Rod Maloney, Local 4. Cool. That's a pretty cool effect, hanging out like with the it. players. Yep. Uh, by the way, Tom Wilson also told us they remain very committed now to filling in the full 50 blocks in completing District Detroit, but it's going to take some time. It could take five to ten years to get it all done. Pretty exciting day over there. Yeah, yeah. really great. Uh, today, President Trump ended the Obama administration's program that allowed undocumented immigrants who came to the U.S. as children to stay in the country. Congress now has six months to save the program known as DACA. The plan announced today by 
by Attorney General Jeff Sessions will stop accepting new applications immediately. The DACA recipients with a permit will be allowed to stay for now. Reaction to the decision has been swift with protests all across the country, including right here in Metro Detroit. Coco McAvoy is live at Clark Park in southwest Detroit, where a protest is just getting underway. Coco. Karen and Devin, the rain has delayed the march just a little bit, but if you peer through the crowd, you can see dozens of people came out here. They came with their families. They have a clear message and statement. As we walk around this way, you can see there are lots of flags. There are signs. They're all organizing here, and they tell me that their message is simple and clear to keep DACA. Dozens of people gathered in Troy and Detroit. Rise up! DACA was using signs and their voices to fight for DACA. We want like our rights to be heard. Several people shared their stories about being brought to the U.S. at a very young age. DACA kids are welcome here. Our parents made a mistake when they brought us here, but there's no future in Mexico. They're attending college to fulfill their dreams. We can build something in this world, too. Bartos Kumor hopes to run for office someday. He came to the U.S. when he was 10 years old from Poland. There are a lot of people here who have my back, and uh, there are uh, millions of others around the country who feel the same way we do. Though there are some people who disagree. I think it's great people are expressing their opinions, and it's, it's done in a very nice way very impressive. Um, I'm the opposition. Bob Silverman is a Troy resident and believes DACA is lowering our wages. It's changing our heritage, our culture. I like America the way it is. Kumar says the DACA recipients are just as American as anyone else. The vast majority of us are working extremely hard, going to school and paying our taxes. So he and thousands of others plan to keep fighting for DACA. <laughs> And out here live now, the march will start very shortly, but coming up at 6 o'clock, we have a very personal story to share with you of a woman who came here when she was 14 years old, and now she's not sure what to do. Back to you. Okogo, I know you've spoken with many DACA recipients. Do they mention when the program expires for them? What do they plan to do next? I think we lost the signal there from Coco. We'll continue to follow what's going on at Clark Park. I'm over here now with Ben as we are watching Hurricane Irma. And uh, we are already with the understanding, even before it gets here, this is one of the most powerful Atlantic hurricanes I've ever measured. There's a short list. Yeah. Uh, and Irma's on it. Uh, we're going to look at how confident we are in the track of this. And unfortunately, uh, fairly confident. I wish we could say otherwise, but this is a Category 5 storm, and I want to show you what the computer models are doing. You can see that there's pretty remarkable consistency between all of these models. Uh, they're kind of tightly clustered there, just bringing that uh, core of Irma just north of Cuba. And you can see that that peach line, the TVCN, that's what we call the consensus model. That's where they just sort of average all of them, and unfortunately, that's right in the middle. So once it gets past Cuba, this storm is going to turn to the north. The question is how soon, and there are two players in that. There's a trough here in the U.S., and then there's a high out into the Atlantic, what we call the Bermuda High. That high is going to be receding, and as it does, that's going to sort of open the door for Irma to turn to the north. It's just a question of how quickly does that high recede, and how quickly does that turn happen? Does it turn quick and more of Miami in play, or does it turn late and possibly hit Tampa as an initial landfall in Florida? So the takeaway here is Florida definitely in play for the storm. It's just too early to tell exactly where, but it is a large, powerful storm, so most of South Florida is going to get impacted either way. Guys? Thank you, Ben. Meantime, Hurricane Harvey may be gone, but the thousands of families are still feeling the storm's wake and its aftermath. Uh, frustration, in fact, beginning to boil over in some parts of Houston as what started to look like a light at the end of the tunnel took a turn. Western parts of the city still flooding today due to uh, controlled releases from the nearby reservoirs. Uh, that means thousands are losing what dry ground there was, which is sparking a lot of frustration. Never in my wildest imagination could I have ever ever picture this in my mind. This is the sacrificial area for all of Houston. 
The floodwaters should recede across the region in the next week or two, but that's still a long wait. So long yep. to wait for that. Detroit police are making some big donations to first responders of Hurricane Harvey down in Houston. It was announced today that alongside nearly a dozen other companies, Detroit police will collect personal care items for two days in hopes to fill a semi truck, which will be donated to the Houston Police Department. As Lieutenant Potts talked about, it was interesting that she called me around the same time I started thinking, you know, what can we do to help Houston? As of this morning, 10 o'clock this morning, uh, this uh, beautiful semi from Rush Trucking was delivered. And so this is a 48 hour donation period where uh, anyone from the community can bring in any kind of goods. General RV will also be donating an RV, which 10 police officers from Detroit will ride in as they escort the semi down to Houston. Firefighters in Oregon still trying to get the upper hand as they battle a wildfire near Portland that's now been burning since last week. The Eagle Creek fire has burned nearly 5,000 acres. No injuries reported yet. Uh, one person, though, has been taken into custody on suspicion of starting that fire with fireworks. An uh, interstate freeway near the fire was closed yesterday because of the poor visibility caused by all that smoke. Wow. An officer involved uh, shooting is under investigation after a news photographer is shot. This was the situation Monday night in New Carlisle, Ohio. Photographer Andy Grimm was taking pictures on the scene of a traffic stop when he was shot by Deputy Jake Shaw. Police say Shaw mistook Grimm's tripod and camera for a weapon. The deputy opened fire, hitting the photographer in the side. Grimm was rushed to the hospital where he underwent surgery and is expected to make a full recovery. Local 4 is teaming up with several community organizations to shine a spotlight on the opioid crisis. We hope you'll join us all day tomorrow for our special coverage, Opioid Nation, an American Epidemic. We'll have stories tackling this topic in every one of our newscasts. We'll have phone banks set up with experts prepared to answer your questions about this enormous problem, all leading up to our primetime program live at 10 p.m. tomorrow night, taking an in-depth look at opioid addiction. I hope. For most, today was the first day of school, and for just about anyone, it's easy to remember those first day nerves, the anxiety. Well, as Paula Tutman shows us, we're not talking about just the students. So we spent the day at Barnard Elementary School in Troy, and we understand that the first day of school can have some real anxiety-ridden moments, particularly for younger kids. But they don't compare to some of the parents. Do I get a hug? For sure. First day of school at Barnard Elementary School in Troy, and there have been more than a few happy moments. Are you ready for school? Yeah! And of course, a few anxious moments, not just for the little kids, but for the parents of the little kids. It's my last year. Sending a child to school is stressful. For Ken Heikinen, he found himself wandering past his daughter's kindergarten class over She's right there. and over <laughs> and over again. <laughs> Much to the chagrin, yeah, of the kindergartner. <laughs> That's a lot. I mean, just to make sure they get to the right place and how are they going to do at lunch. And I've walked by the door like three, four, or five times just to see her. It's emotional for parents who see their babies are not really babies anymore. Tia Gilmore's daughter is in the fourth grade. How did that happen? Wasn't she just born yesterday? And leaving me and she was like, bye, see you later. <laughs> like it was nothing. <laughs> and Lindsay Burling admits she is over anxious. First day in fourth grade, and I'm anxious because he's got asthma and allergies. His emotions like might be high, his emotions might be low, and I really get anxious for him. You saw our parents, they're on site. Um, they need a little love, they need a little guidance. They need to make sure that they see the safety precautions we put into place. And so at Barnard, parents are eased out on the first day of school with a little conversation. Hi confidence building, reassurances, and then encouragement to let their children become students. Paula Tutman, Local 4. Makes me want to cry. Yeah, how's the anxiety <laughs> level going there, Mom? I made it one week, but I totally relate to them, and I was the one who kept going by the classroom looking, but I stopped. I have to go to work. <laughs> I just got to remember the do that? it seemed more celebratory to me that school started. Yeah. 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 See you guys later. Uh, all it took was one false move. I wasn't really processing the situation at all. You know, I was just kind of freaking out. Man. New denied how a freak accident almost cost this man his life. 
Also, it may be one of the most unusual races you've ever seen. New here at 530, we'll take you to the Hamtramck Yacht Races. But first, tension with North Korea hits a new level, and it's all because of something Russian President Vladimir Putin said. We'll explain next. Gather the family. New at 6. A Metro Detroit community on edge after a thief walks into a fast food restaurant. What he made off with that has police on the lookout. Also, a harmful virus could offer a surprising new treatment for a major disease. The intriguing benefit to the Zika virus at 6. Tensions continue tonight to rise on the Korean Peninsula. South Korea conducts a live fire drill as a show of force against the North Korea's latest missile test. Meantime, Russian President Vladimir Putin today condemned North Korea's nuclear test, but also warned against using military force against the country, calling it a road to nowhere that could lead to a global catastrophe. Now to something you might not know. The city of Hamtramck has a yacht club. Landlocked city doesn't even have a river going through it, but it has a yacht club. Here's where it gets even more interesting. The Hamtramck Yacht Club holds yacht races every Labor Day weekend. These aren't your average yachts, however. Photojournalist Alex Atwell was there. The citizens are the oceans to which these boats float on. Watch your children. Don't let them run out for the boats. They are going at high rate of speed. I'm Frank Woodman, Commodore, if you will of the high seas of Hamtramck. The Hamtramck Yacht Club races, canoe races. It's pure chaos. Two, three, we do water balloons every year. We throw them at the canoes running up and down Joseph Campo. Water balloons, squirt guns, coolers full of water. Yeah, yeah, so we brought our own water balloons. We'll race up and down in wood boats that they made. Some of them are pretty horrific. A lot of kids out here today. A lot of locals celebrate the end of summer. It's a beautiful thing. It's a great time. I mean, we all have fun. We know how to do it right. It really is about sportsmanship and uh, fellowship. At the end of the day, we all celebrate together and we really rip on the winners. 